right. Um, before I start on this, because I do run a B-Sides, I know how important the sponsors are to the B-Sides community. So be sure to thank the sponsors. Go talk to them. Tell them thank you for supporting the B-Sides because without the sponsors, these things wouldn't happen. So be sure to express that to them so that we can get them to come back year after year. So uh, presentation, Moment Neat Chop. This is inside of an employment scam. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, then I'm going to outline the scam, just kind of tell you how this works from beginning to end. And then I'm actually going to walk you through this. Um, we have uh, lots of screenshots and conversations between a victim and one of the scammers that they sh the victims had shared with us. So we're going to walk this through. You're going to see all of the screenshots. And then we're going to talk about what we did at AFLAC. So it's um, internal because it, it, we had to have some internal support. We also had some external support. So we're going to talk through all of that. So as Erin mentioned, um, my name is Beth Young. I run the B-Side Springfield. I work for AFLAC. I've been there mm, almost five years now, I think. Before that, I was at Jack Henry and Associates, and then for almost 20 years at the University of Missouri. <clears throat> so what is an employment scam? This usually starts with a person posting their resume on a job site. It's going to be someplace like Indeed.com, ZipRecruiter, Monster.com. We have seen all over the place, there was no one spot that the scammers were picking from. Um, we heard about these scams from all of the job sites. Once the person has posted their resume, they get contacted by an HR recruiter. Notice that's in quotes because obviously it's the scammer. They're gonna uh, reach out to that person either by text or by email. If they put their phone number on there, they usually reach out by text. Otherwise, it did start by email. They were then told to install a secure messenger app. In our case, it was always Wire, but we have seen other cases and heard of other scammers that like to use Telegram, WhatsApp, Signal. There, it's all over the place. But in our case specifically, they were using an application called Wire. This person is then interviewed. Um, strange interview, it's always done over text, there is no video, there is no voice, it was always done over text messages. And then the person's going to get a job offer, and then they're told they either need to go buy equipment, and then it has to be shipped somewhere to be configured. Um, obviously if they ship the equipment off, um, it's usually never seen again. Or they could be told to supply bank information, um, direct deposit information, sometimes just credit card numbers. Usually there's a money mule, they'll either be turned into a money mule or they're shipping money to a money mule. Um, but again, once the money is gone, it's usually just gone. So what does this look like? This is one of the emails that was sent to one of the victims that we spoke to. Um, you'll notice that this says, uh, I am Max Broden. Max Broden does actually work at, oh, awesome, thank you. <laughs> My new Hebrew. <laughs> um, so Max Broden does actually work at AFLAC. If you Google his name, it will show up as AFLAC. Um, the only problem is he's not a recruiter. He is our CFO. So, um, yeah, they picked a high up person here. I'm not sure if anybody has told Mr. Broden that he's been demoted yet, but uh, he, he is, they're using his name. And then you'll see as you read through here that uh, they're offering a job as a customer support representative and they're going to be paid $30 an hour which of course in today's job market, that's pretty good for a customer support rep. And they're told to install the wire messenger for secure messaging and to reach out to a Mr. Brian Richard. So one of our victims got this and then she did install the wire app and then she reached out to Brian Richard. And so what I'm gonna show you is 
compressed. So this actually went on for several days. So I want to point out as I go through this, it's easy for us to see the red flags because we are looking at it in a compressed format and we're seeing it in 50 minutes. This conversation actually happened over about four days. So I did put some dates in here so you can kind of see how he was grooming her. Because what I want to really get people to think about is these people are not stupid. They're not your losers that are out there that why did they miss all of this? These people are being groomed for this and they do spend several days in these environments trying to groom these people. So we can't, we have to stop blaming the victims um, because if we blame them, they're not going to report it. It makes it harder for us to shut these things down. So with that in mind, on Friday, um, one of our victims, we're, we're gonna just call her D, um, reached out to Mr. Brian Richard and he's like, good day, it's nice to see you. How are you doing? He's doing, you know, the polite conversation, get to know you type questions. And then he's like, are you ready for an interview? We're gonna conduct this interview over a, a text message here so that he can just cut and paste questions to her basically. So one of the first questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show my age here, but do you guys still remember the ASL? age, sex, location, common thing. That's what the scammers start with, ASL. So um, he's asking, you know, where are you from? Um, wh where are you living? How old are you? Just basic get to know you questions. Again, he's trying to build a rapport with this person because it will make it easier for him to ask those difficult questions or sneak in some of those questions like bank information. So they have this conversation, it goes on for a few minutes, and then he's like, okay, well, let me tell you a little bit about Aflac. And so, this, you know, screens of text comes through. I didn't put all of them up here, but there was screens of text. And we're reading through this going, wow, you know, this is pretty accurate. But he didn't steal it from our website, so where are they pulling this information? And then we happened to notice that there was a footnote in there, and it's like, huh, I bet that's the Wikipedia article for Aflac, which it was. They were just cutting and pasting directly from our Wikipedia article. So he gave her a lot of information um, uh, from about Aflac, what we did. And then he's like, okay, well, we need to ask you some questions. So he asked, sent her a list of 11 questions, and he really didn't care about the answers, especially on questions one through nine. And these questions are like, um, how many words per minute do you type? Are you currently employed? He really didn't care about the answers to those. What he really wanted was questions 10 and 11. What bank do you, op to, do you use? And do you want prepaid or postpaid? This is that start of those grooming. Well, this was part of my interview question, so I guess this is stuff that they need to know. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and answer that because they're mixed in with all of the other questions that would be normal interview questions. So we've started that grooming process. They discussed those questions. Again, it went on for um, several minutes. I think it was actually close to an hour. They were discussing her answers, what she felt about the job, did she think she could do it? And then he's like, okay, well, equipment. Here's the equipment that you're going to be using. And you'll notice that it's all top of the line equipment. We've got an Apple MacBook Pro here. We've got a really nice printer. All high end equipment. And again, we're starting to place in the, the victim's mind that, oh, this is equipment that I'm gonna be using, this is gonna be great. Um, he says at this point that he will provide it. He being Aflac will provide this equipment. You'll see later on, he starts uh, qualifying that statement a little bit. They talk, again, they talk for several hours on Friday and he's like, okay, that's enough for today. You've done a really good job. 
you know, you're, we really like what your answers were, we think you're going to be a great fit, but I need to go talk to somebody else. I need to go talk to my HR department about this. So why don't we meet up again tomorrow and we'll talk some more. But first, just give me this, this information. So again, he's asking for full name, address, telephone number, etc. And of course, she gives it to him. So they end on Friday and they come up on Saturday. Now, I don't know about you all, but my HR department does not work on Saturdays. But we have a conversation that picks up on Saturday. And it, I, I'm still a late sleeper. I am not up at 7.46 a.m. on a Saturday. But she's up, she's ready to go. She reaches out to Brian, Mr. Brian Richard again. And again, he starts that conversation. Oh, we're just friends. So he's like, you know, how did you sleep last night? Did you have a good night? Did you have a good evening? And so he's working on that friendship piece with her. So they, they talk a little bit more, and then he comes right out and says, yay, you got the job. You know, can you start Monday? Again, most jobs are not going to be interview on Friday and you're hired on Saturday, especially for some kind of customer support position. But in this case, she's like, that's awesome. I got a job. Yes, I can start on Monday. Um, and this is, again, where he starts talking about, uh, you know, before we had the list of equipment. Here's where he starts planting in her mind that she's going to have to buy the equipment and then maybe be, being, be reimbursed for that. So you're starting on Monday, but then he says, and I have to put my glasses on so I can actually read this. Um, the, funds, uh, the funds for the software and working equipment will be provided for you by the company. So now he started that grooming of well, we're going to give you the money to go buy the equipment. Um, we're just not going to ship you equipment. So he started her thinking about this, and this becomes important a little bit later on. And then um, they, they, again, they talk for a few more um, minutes on, on Saturday. They disconnect. She comes back Monday. Again, it's a really early on Monday morning, but they connect back up. She's bright and early. She's ready to go. They start that conversation again. And remember, grooming. Uh, you can trust me. I'm your friend. I want to know how you're doing. So how was your Sunday? How was your weekend? So they have some conversations. And then he says, um, again, put the glasses on so I can see. Um, note that the reason why we are sending you the funds is to ensure a good working relationship between the employer and the employee. Uh, okay, you trusted me enough to hire me, but now you're testing me by sending me funds to buy equipment. Um, again, it's easy for us to look at this and go, that's really odd. He's obviously grooming her. But for her and most victims, it's like, well, I don't know how this remote work actually works anymore. Maybe this is normal. Maybe this is the new normal. So he's going to send her funds. And then he starts asking about her bank information. Um, let me see if it's on the screen. Um, he starts asking, what bank did you open? So she had told him previously that she didn't have a bank account, but she had opened one. So now he starts asking, you know, what bank did you open? And do you have a debit card? Strange questions, but at this point, she feels really comfortable with him. You can kind of tell that she's not questioning what's going on that she's just rolling with these questions. So um, she doesn't have a debit card yet, but she has opened the account. So that was the first bump in the road for our scammer. She doesn't have an active bank account. Um, she says, she, I've not received it yet. The debit card is coming in the mail. And he's like, okay, well, we can just deal with that. 
Um, before we proceed any further, do you have a credit card? So he really wanted that debit card because obviously a debit card gets them direct access to her bank account. But he'll sell it for a credit card. And then he wants to know what's the limit on her credit card. And also, what phone company do you use? I don't think I have ever been asked who my phone provider is at any job. Uh, maybe it's because people give me the work phone because I'm on call, but I, I'm not sure exactly why he wanted to know what uh, phone provider she had, but he asked, so she answers. And then, um, again, they talked for a little bit more, and Mr. Richard seems okay. It's like, oh, well, you don't have a bank account yet, but, you know, that's okay. I can, I can deal with this just... Let me know when the bank account is active and you have the money. And they end that conversation. Now, I don't have what happened in between here. There, there wasn't any screenshots or breaks um, in our, the data that we received. But somehow, our victim got it in her head that because she was sent a PDF document for reimbursement, that she needed to go out and buy the equipment. And speculation on my part, I admit this, but I suspect it's because he kept asking her about the money that she had in her account, did she have a credit card, the equipment, the, the statements about the funds. She got it in her head that she needed to buy the equipment locally. So they stopped conversing in the morning and she comes back, and I think the time on this is close to 2 p.m. Yes, so about 2 p.m., she reaches out to him again and was like, Mr. Richard, I can't find this equipment locally. What am I supposed to do here? And he acts all surprised. <gasps> really? You're going to buy equipment and then we'll just reimburse you? That's so awesome. You're going to be a great employee. You can just see that in the text. So she has now got it in her mind that she has to buy the equipment. And, you know, she actually says, well, I thought that's what the reimbursement form was for. Will the company be shipping the equipment? And he's like, no, 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 you, you can go buy it and we'll just get it configured or whatever. Um, so they, things go silence and then he pings her and was like, um, is there, she asked, is there a specific site to order from? And he's like, um, before we proceed, how much money can you come up with? Basically, he's trying to figure out how much money can I take her for? So how much line of credit does she have? And um, he says, can you come up with $1,000? Um, are you able to come up with $1,000 for the purchase of your working equipment? So he's like, uh, I've got it. She's hooked. I might be able to get $1,000 out of her. So um, she's like, she, she was a little concerned. I'm not sure exactly how to do this. And he's like, don't worry about it. Just follow my directions. He's going to walk her through how to do this. And the instructions... Um, to be followed are, it, it's broken English here, but um, are you familiar with Apple Pay? She's like, sorry, I don't have Apple Pay. He's like, okay, well, no Apple Pay. Do you have a Bitcoin ATM close? And he's, she's like, no cash app. Do you use Zelle? Um, working in the financial industry, I know Zelle has been the, the app, I guess, you are the, the service that these scammers like to use. There's not as much fraud detection around the Zelle and the payment transfers, so they really like to use it at the moment, and the banks are obviously scrambling trying to figure out how to do this and protect the Zelle accounts. Um, but she go, he goes through this list, you know, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Zelle. Finally, she says, I have Cash App. So he's like, awesome, Cash App. I can get some money through Cash App. So um, 
He's like, I need you to transfer $1,000 to this account, and the account name is Matt D. Dixon. So here's our first actual account that we have that we're going to uh, turn over to law enforcement. We're going to talk to the Cash App people to try to get this account shut down. So, but, you know, we're still in the middle of the scam here. So uh, he's like, don't send it all in one lump sum, though, because obviously Cash App has something in here that is looking for people transferring large amounts of money. He wants this broken up into two payments of $500 a piece, sent to this to us, a random person. But for him, he's like, oh, he's a vendor, he'll go out, send him $1,000 and we'll get, you'll get your equipment. So we have our first account for this, but it runs into a problem, remember. She did not have an active bank account. She was just still setting it up. So she had told him that she was waiting for a wire transfer. She went to her grandmother to get money, get the thousand dollars that the scammer wanted. The, the grandmother was going to wire the money into her account so that she could then send it to the scammer. So it was taking a while. And Gosh, Grandma couldn't make it to the bank that day. It might be tomorrow before that money was transferred, which in this case was good because she didn't have the money to send to the scammer and we got it stopped. We, we talked to her before that money was transferred. But for our poor little scammer here, Mr. Brian Richard, he's like, where's my money? It's been a couple hours. It's, I, at this point, it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and he's still waiting. You know, he's had his money meal ready, waiting for those $500 transfers to come in. But he still doesn't have his money. So he's like, okay, well, I, I understand you're still waiting for the wire transfer. We'll just pick this up in the morning. And so they, they really wanted that money, and he thought he had, you know, a, a live person, a live victim on here. And she's just managed to avoid him. So, um, let's see. Okay, this was the conversations. You know, I'm still waiting for the money. So, they break off the conversation. It starts up again Tuesday. Um, they, again, they start at 7.30 in the morning. Um, and he's like, you know, good morning. How are you doing today? Again, having that conversation, making sure that they're friends. And then they chat for about an hour, and the last message that they had sent was at 8.35 a.m. Um, once you have the $1,000 at hand, please notify me immediately, and I'll get you more instructions. And I say that was the last conversation because by that point, both her mom and her grandma had said, I think this is a scam. Please reach out to Aflac and find out for sure. So she, her family had stepped in, said something doesn't feel right about this, please call Aflac. And so we talked to her and it was like, yes, we're, we're so sorry that this happened to you, but yes, this was a scam. So some of the supporting documentation that had been sent. So most of these victims were emailed PDFs um, from a corporate person these PDFs are awful. Um, most are very poorly designed. The logos would never pass any kind of corporate communications. Um, there's typos in there. There's set employment contracts where the fields are blank. There's different fonts that are in use. It's just, they're, they're a nightmare to look at. And then, um, most of them had Dan Amos, and if you don't know anything about Aflac, this name means nothing to you, but he's one of the, he's actually the son of one of the founders of Aflac. So he's our CEO, but he has also been demoted. Uh, Mr. Amos is demoted to a managing director position from CEO. Again, I'm not sure if anybody has told him this yet. Um, so, but they were trying to, at least put enough legitimate names in there 
that it would pass at least a cursory Google search, you know, is, is Dan Amos associated with Aflac? Yes, he is. It just happens that his signature was as a manager director, not a CEO. So these are some of the uh, PDFs that were sent to our victims. Um, how many of you have done corporate reimbursements and travel expenditures? Yeah, it's a nightmare, right? Don't you wish it was that easy? Oh look, I'm going to do a name, my, my job title, and how much money do you owe me? No receipts, no nothing. It's like, gosh, if only it was that easy. And then um, the one on the, the upper right, <laughs> get my left and right right here, um, different fonts. This, this first one was probably 2020 at one time, and they went in and changed the font to 20, or the date to 2021. You'll notice also on these logos, they've been stretched. This is not something that I did take in the screenshots, they actually stretched the image to make it go across the screen, which our corporate communications people would be horrified if a new document went out like this. And then of course down in the bottom you can see that they misspelled corporate, but they did get our address right. Our headquarters are in Columbus, Georgia, so they got that right at least. Um, and then this is that blank field that I was talking about. I have never received a job offer where they left my job title blank in the offer letter. This is, um, this is not from victim D. This was a, a second victim that we had talked to. We'll call her L. Um, this is where Dan Amos was demoted to a managing director position. But his signature is easy to find, you know, he's the SEC filings, other documents that are out there. So they had pulled his signature from somewhere and put it into this um, employment letter. And you'll notice again on the logo on this one, um, that was pulled from a, a website called Investopedia. It's not actually an official AFLAC logo. <clears throat> And then this one, if you didn't know what you were looking for, if you were just looking to see, well, is this a well-defined form or not, this form is really well done. You know why? It's a U.S. government form. So this is the direct deposit form for federal employees. So again, if you didn't know what you were looking at or you hadn't read the text across the top to know that a corporation wouldn't be using this, um, it can easily fool somebody, especially since it is a very well-designed form. Even when warned, people were downloading the PDFs. So this is victim S. Victim S was talking to a scammer. You'll notice that we've also moved on from Mr. Brian Richard to just Jack. So Jack and victim S were talking and she was sent the PDF forms and she's like, I get this warning. Now, of course, she's talking to the scammer. So what's the scammer going to say? It's fine. Just ignore that warning. Just download it. it, it it's all fine. But if you, it's really hard to read that text, but the text says, um, this is a, this, these documents could be phishing, you know, make sure who you're getting these documents from, you know, maybe not download them because they're trying to steal your information. And Jack was like, it's fine, just download them. You can ignore that warning. So of course she did. Um, so attribution. We were dealing with this for about six weeks at the beginning of the year. So this was January, end of January through most of February. And we were kind of curious, can we do any kind of attribution for this? So attribution is really, really hard. Um, we suspect we were dealing with Nigerians just based on some of the wording. And the next slide I'll talk a little bit about those linguistics. 
But we didn't have any proof. We, we couldn't prove that we were dealing with Nigerians. Um, we also suspect we might have been dealing with two groups. One group might have been the Nigerians. We also suspect the other one might have been India, could have been Singapore, somewhere in that area of the world. Um, we, we based that on the fact that we had two separate sets of documents that were being sent to the victims. So the one with the Dan Amos signature, that was sent to one group of victims. Those PDFs and like the reimbursement documents were sent to a separate set of victims. So we suspect we might have been dealing with two groups at the time. We're not sure why they hit us both at the same time, but that's kind of what we were suspecting. So the study of linguistics. Do you pay weekly or bi-weekly? That was one of the questions that she was asked very early in this process. This language is very common to the Nigerians. Um, I went to the BEC folks, um, Ronnie, the iHeart Malware, and the, the BEC work that he does. I went to the, him and I was like, okay, what can you tell me about these? Do you recognize any of this type of stuff? And he's like, yeah, that's very common to the Nigerians. They usually get paid weekly. So that is one of the questions that they like to ask. I didn't talk about this yet, but you'll, I, I'll get into this more in a moment. But we had some threat intel guys that decided to kind of infiltrate this and see what they could learn. And they were chatting with the scammers, and they used some Nigerian slang. So this is where the, the title of this talk comes, Moment Me Chop. So our threat intel guys were in a conversation, and they're like, Moment Me Chop. And the response came back immediately, get chop. Which in Nigerian slang means, just a minute, I need to go get some food. And the response was, yes, you know, go, go get some food, go eat, whatever. There was no hesitation or delay in there. So for somebody to understand the Nigerian slang like that, it's like, yeah, that's, that's another tick mark in that, yeah, they're probably Nigerians. And then, of course, for any of you that have been around for a long time, seen the 419 scams, just the wording, kindly do this, hence. Some of the language that they use is, again, very common to those Nigerian groups. But, again, we didn't have any proof. So, what did we do? We had all of this data. What do we do with all of this? So, we decided to start making friends. And it's not just external friends. We made friends with our internal people. We knew that this stuff was happening and we needed to get the word out to all of the groups inside of AFLAC so that they would know what was going on, where to funnel any calls or reports that they got, and what to be, to be aware of this. So we worked a lot with our security awareness groups. Um, this was, our security awareness people had contacts in a lot of departments. We run what we call the ambassador program which every department should have an ambassador. That is the person that the security awareness team works with to get information out into the departments. So we used the R ambassadors to get the word out. We did internal presentations. We sent emails. We put blog posts out. Uh, we talked. We set up a meeting with our human resources and our talent acquisition people. We explained the scam. We basically went through this presentation with them so that they could see what it looked like. They put uh, banners up on websites. So if somebody went to the main AFLAC website or if they went to our careers page, our talent acquisition pages, there was all a banner saying, please be aware that scammers are using our brand. Um, try, again, trying to get the word out so that they knew what to watch for. Our threat intel people, we obviously work really closely from the IR department and our threat intel people. We work closely together, so we sat down and was like, okay, well, what can we do about this? So our threat intel people, 
decided to infiltrate them, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. We also used our brand protection. So we noticed that the scammers were registering email addresses, they were using the um, AFLAC image, so the duck, everybody knows AFLAC is the duck. Um, that is a registered trademark, so if it's showing up on web pages, we can do uh, trademark disputes and get those sites taken down. So we worked with our brand protection people to, to go out there using their tools, look for who is infringing on our brand and get those sites taken down. They had registered a domain that was um, Aflax Inc. Um, for the domain to send some emails from, so we got the domain taken down. The producers, so if you've talked to an Aflac agent before, those agents are 1099 contractors, they're not Aflac employees. Um, so we talked to the producers. So I mentioned that most of this information came from the January, February timeframe. I'm, uh, in my mind, I'm really hoping that we made it so painful for them that they stopped targeting us directly but they started going after our market offices, which are those 1099 employees. So they were using images from some of our agents to start using those for the names and pictures for the employment scams. So we needed to make sure that our producers understood what was going on so that they could tech protect their own market offices also. And Within that was the AFLAC Trust, which again, the trust is part of that brand protection piece. Um, so we had to make all kinds of internal friends. People that the incident response team didn't normally talk to, we were reaching out to them and making friends and letting them know what was going on, which helped immensely. We were getting reports from our special investigation unit, which is mainly focused on insurance fraud. They were getting phone calls and they're like, oh yeah, you need to talk to Beth. And so they were funneling phone calls to me. I was getting them from our customer support center, the HR department, I got to know them really well. So I, I really want to stress, you cannot do this as an incident response person alone. You need to make friends throughout the organization if you're dealing with this, because you're gonna need all of that support to get these, to cause pain to the scammers. So we also need to make external friends. So our threat intel team was like, okay, well we know about Mr. Brian Richard, we know about Jack, we knew about several Gmail uh, domains, our email addresses. We've got those taken down, but what if the scammers are still out there? You know, what if somebody hasn't reported something to us? So they brushed off all of their OPSEC and went out there and posted some fake resumes and, and started talking to these scammers. Um, one of our threat intel guys had five jobs at AFLAC at one point, one real one and four fake ones. So he was getting new account information. Uh, we were trying to map out their infrastructure and we used all of that information to do takedowns of their account, try to cause them pain, get their infrastructure um, taken down. So we reported email addresses. You know, we had one, we had several that were using Gmail accounts. We reported all of those. Now, I will say that I'm a little disappointed in Google. Um, there was a aflacinc.hr desk was one of the email addresses that was used way back in February. We reported it, we showed the documentation where we reported it. Um, the scammers used it again in August. So obviously the account wasn't taken down like we thought it was. Um, so if you're gonna do this, lesson learned for me was verify that all of the email addresses that we've reported have been taken down. Um, I've never had a problem with Google not following through with takedowns before, so that was a little bit of a surprise for me. We reported the Cash App account um, are any of the other bank accounts that we found 
Um, we used the BEC group to do some money mule reporting and takedowns. Uh, we didn't have any cash app person that we knew, so we used um, our FSI SAC people to make some introductions. So we made friends at Cash App, which is owned by Square. So <clears throat> we made friends with these people. Uh, we've got, gotten to be on really good terms with the security people at Wire, the Messenger app. Um, they are very helpful in getting us information when we report count, accounts to them. Again, we trolled the fraudsters. We, we went, worked with them. Um, again, this is an expert's game, just like other people have said, don't expect to just go into this not knowing how to do good OPSEC. Um, and we found more email addresses. We found that domain that we did do a takedown on. We did report everything that we found to law enforcement. We have, uh, there's a local FBI office in Columbus. So we were reporting this to them. Obviously, we weren't expecting them to go kicking down doors and make arrests or anything. That, that was not our expectation. But we knew that they do collect this evidence. So let's just add our, all of our evidence into this and maybe eventually some charges would be filed. And then awareness. Let's do presentations like this one. Let's get the word out. You know, maybe you go home tonight and you're like, wow, I saw this really awesome presentation. Let me tell you what, this ha what happens on this. Maybe you talk to your friends, maybe you're at the hairdressers, whatever. But if you're talking to people about this, maybe they will not become a victim. Because that's really what we're trying to do is disrupt their business model so that it's not profitable for them. So getting the word out, we hope that we can stop receiving these phone calls about these employment scams. But I will say, <laughs> I'm hopeful, but I have a friend that was job hunting this summer, and I would say 90% of the contacts that she got were from fraudsters over the summer. Not Aflac specifically, but um, it was just, she had one where she actually was going to do a video interview, and oh gosh darn it, the network went down, so we're going to do it over text. And then the scam for that one was, well, I need you to pay me $100 so I can do a background check on you. So it, it's going to be difficult, you, you know, but again, all we can do is get the word out so that maybe people won't fall victim. This was not a one and done event. The scammers do seem to come in waves. We battled this for about six weeks in the spring. They came back this summer. Um, this summer they did target the market offices and our producers instead of Aflac corporate. Be ready for bad days. Um, when I talked to all of the victims in the spring, they had all realized that it was a scam before they lost money. This summer, I talked to a woman that lost money and can no longer pay her rent. And she was convinced that if she just talked to Emily, it would all be straightened out. And no matter what I said to her, and was like, Emily is a scammer, she was convinced that Emily would fix it. She just needed to talk to Emily. It would all be all right. And she had already given the fraudsters her bank account information, her credit card information. She had lost about $850, but she was just convinced that Emily would fix it all. I tried to get her to go to the police. I tried to get her to call her bank, and I just was not getting through to her. And at some point, I had to stop the conversations because I was afraid if I continued that conversation that she would start equating the scammers and the money with Aflac. And at that point, I had to stop the conversations because there was nothing that I could do 
and there was nothing Aflac would be able to do. So there will be bad days. You are going to talk to victims that have lost money and are absolutely convinced that they just talked to the right person that it will all be all right. It was all just a mistake. But this woman didn't have the money to pay her rent and there was nothing I could do about it. Remember the scammers do groom their victims. I've talked uh, about 50 minutes on this and you can see there were all kinds of red flags in there. But we saw it in a very compressed format. It was a lot easier to see those red flags in a compressed format like this. The scammers are really good at grooming their victims and they will spend hours talking to these victims to build that rapport with them so that they feel like they can trust the scammers, like that Emily. If I just talk to Emily, she'll fix this for me. That's the scammers doing that grooming. And then if you do see, run into this, report those accounts. Try to disrupt their op operations. Um, it might seem like it's just short-term games. You're playing whack-a-mole. The cybersecurity people are experts at whack-a-mole. We, we do this with everything. But all we can do is report those accounts and try to disrupt those operations, especially for people that are overseas. Like, if these really were the Nigerians, we're not going to have law enforcement running over there to make arrests. But we can hope that if law enforcement gathers enough evidence, that they will get interested enough to make some arrests. Law enforcement moves slowly, though. Remember, if I report it now, it could be two years before they have enough information to make a case. So report them. Even though it seems like you're just uh, spinning your wheels, report them. It does help in the long term. And then work on those internal communications. Make those friends because you will need them as you go through this process. So, any questions? Yes? I want to first say I really appreciate the humanity and not victim blaming. I know I've attended other talks where it's like, oh, ha, ha, look, look, we got owed. But like you said, we have one individual that can't make rent. Um, this is actually something that I've seen both professionally and also within my own professional networks, uh, this type of a uh, um, attack vector. Um, can you speak to the demographic of the uh, victims, especially the successful victims that lost money? Are, are you seeing a lot of individuals that are either uh, recent, recent uh, Recently, exiting school, or perhaps they came from another industry where they're not going to be familiar with uh, corporate communications and, and best practices. Can you talk about that? Okay, for those that didn't hear, he's asking about the demographics. Do I have any dem demographics about the victims? I don't have official demographics. I can tell you the victims that I talked to went the whole spectrum of ages. Um, obviously, I don't know if a, a race, religion, any of that. Um, to me, they were voices on the other end of the phone. For the ones that I do have ages on, because I had these communications, I kind of know. You know, one of the questions was, how old are you? So I had kind of some ages in there. And they went everywhere from a 22-year-old person living in Texas to a 45-year-old man living in Maryland. So there, there was no pattern that I could discern um, for the demographics on this. I know for the ones that I had some deep conversations with, um, most of them were just now getting back into the workforce. So they had been out of the workforce for a while. Um, the 22-year-old was a mother of two. Um, just based on some things she said, she was a single mom. She was working, living with her, her mom and her grandma. So from that, you can kind of maybe infer lower income. But 
Um, I don't know that for sure, but she did say that she was just getting into the workforce, which is why she wasn't surprised. She wasn't sure how the remote work actually worked. Um, so there, there did seem to be some confusion about um, this would be the, this is the new normal because this is how it works when you are a remote employee. And I did hear that a couple times. Good, good question. Yes. First of all, uh, great talk. Uh, second, any tips or tricks for? Uh, You're going to speak up. Any tips or tricks that you might have uh, for people to put in, like their um, standard instruction style playbook? Okay, say that again. Any instructions that I can put in for playbooks, IR playbooks? No. Um, do you have any like tips or tricks that you can give around, you know, disrupting? The scammer, like you went, you went down the path of like IR and Intel. Like any tips or tricks that companies can use to help like disrupt or take down the scammers a little bit um, to make it harder for them. Um. So the question was, um, do I have any tips or tricks on how to do some of the takedowns, how to disrupt the scammers? Um, I I don't really. Um, Aflac, I don't know if you guys have heard the term, the the security one percenters. AFLAC has a really strong uh, security department. Um, we participate in a lot of threat intel groups, so we did leverage those threat intel groups. We're a member of the FSI SAC. Um, our threat intel team and me are part of some information sharing, global information sharing groups. Um, so we did leverage the contacts that we had made there. For smaller companies, um, use your FS, your, sorry, not just FS ISAC, but use your ISAC. Um, if you're a small company and you don't belong to one of the information sharing and analysis centers, um, there's a bunch of them out there. Start investigating some of those. Which one would I belong to? There's a retail ISAC. There's the research and education network ISAC. FS ISAC is financial services. Um, there's an airline I ISAC, multi-state ISAC. If you don't fall under any one specific ISAC, check to see if you can report it to your multi-state ISAC, which is part of your state government. Um, I, I can't think of any specific steps that I would take, because obviously anybody can use the abuse address to report um, emails or spam or something, so um, use those abuse addresses. That's why they're there. That's why companies publish them. So, good. Yes? So, outside of gathering uh, accounts uh, that they use, like the Cash App or Signal and that sort of thing, was there any other metrics that you were able to gather to help in your reporting to uh, law enforcement and to these different abuse inboxes? Let me make sure I got this. Was there anything else that I used when I was gathering account information when I was reporting to law enforcement? Right. Was there any other metrics that you kind of that you gathered for, for that sort of thing that we? Yeah. There, there was not. Um, we did a lot of screenshots with the victims that we we packaged those up and sent them to law enforcement. Um, most of our reporting was, um, for example, the Wire app. They had to uh, register with an email address. So we included that registration information, the IP address, any information that Wire was willing to share. Um, if we had the full headers from like the email, the emails, we did do some forensics work on the PDFs, trying to see if there was something inside the PDFs, like where were they created. Um, that was what led us to think that maybe we had a second group that, would, that was targeting us. Um, some of those PDFs had been created in a plus eight time zone. So it was like, well, that, that kind of says that there is another group involved here. But it could have just been that's maybe where they had bounced through in their communications. Um, we, we did give all of that information to law enforcement. We don't know how much it actually helped. Law enforcement is a one-way push most of the time, and we don't get a lot back of 
hey, this was really helpful, do this again type information from law enforcement. Was this faster than you? Like a court to the news? Did this go to the news? Yeah, like a four channel even. No, I mean, no. It did not make the news anywhere. Like I said, we did put banners on our web pages so that if somebody went to our talent acquisition page, they did see that scammers were hitting us. But no, this this did not make the news. Because most of the people in the demographic are always looking for a job, probably not going to Right. Yeah. the The comment was, well, you know, the demographics of speak people were um, targeting would might not go to our web page and might see the news. But the problem with that is, like I said, we talked to somebody in Texas, we talked to somebody in Maryland. I think there was one from Tennessee, one from Georgia, one from Florida. They were just all over the place. Um, and when again, most of the victims that I talked to figured out that they were being scammed and did not lose any money. So at that point, the story really is what, um, you know, the, the sad to say, what makes the news is the woman that lost her retirement money, not, oh, well, I was almost scammed. Um, those just don't make the news. Yeah. And, but again, I'm presenting, I'm getting the word out. I'm hoping you guys do the same thing. Talk to your family and friends and let them know how these things work so maybe they don't become a victim. Good. Good question. Anything else? A round of applause for Beth. That's what. That's what I like to hear.